um, with this idea of forecasting fundamental trends that you mentioned. Um, can you expand a little bit on that? We've had a couple of questions. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> um, there is not a lot of forecasting. I have never seen actually any forecasting of technologies at Google. Um, there is a lot of experimentation. There is um, anything between 25 to 30,000 engineers uh, working on their core tasks and then taking on additional projects on the side that we are known for. And they constantly try new things out and are valued for trying new things out. And um, one of the conditions for them to be able to gain resource and potentially budget to work on their project is to make their project interesting enough so that other engineers and then marketeers and salespeople, you know, will be enticed to work along them. So it is, it is sort of a positive um, self-reinforcing mechanism why, you know, if you, if you believe in your project, you try it out, you make it look good, you, you convince other people to work with you, and that's the way you get the ball rolling. Um, and different things happen in parallel in the same time, and some things work, some things don't work. Um, and, yeah, that's how things go. But I want to stay with this idea of forecasting, Dominic, and turn to you, because if we listen to uh, Misha's suggestion of, of that uh, we're going to have doctors working remotely, and you mentioned 5G, then you need to be able to forecast that that connection is not going to go down just as someone slices into a patient. Yeah, I mean, a forecasting, I agree, is more and more complex. I mean, we used to have uh, five-year plans, and when I came, I said, there is no point in doing five-year plans, so we are now doing three-year plans. And even there, the first year, we can say it's probably right, and the two years after, it's more directional. The only thing where we do much longer-term planning is indeed for network, and there we have 10 years plans, because in the end, network is about trenching, it's about choosing a technology, it's getting permits for antenna, get, getting permits for street cabinets, and there you still need to plan. The issue there is that you plan a deployment, but you are still not sure what is the latest technology that you will use. So you have to do some assumptions, you do research, uh, development together with some suppliers, and along the road, you need to keep your uh, flexibility to see how you adapt a new technology into your roadmap, which is really not easy because, uh, and certainly when you have to plan network deployment where you really have to work with subcontractors, with cities, with agreement, with planning, it's, um, it's requiring a lot of flexibility from us, but also a lot of flexibility from the partners. So planning is more and more complex, that's for sure. And Mish, can you pick up on that then? You know, you've got a great idea, but there isn't the infrastructure to do it. Is that a problem? Well. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm being paid salary to actually screw up all the planning exercises, right? So that's the idea of uh, doing all that work in, uh, at university. Um, no, I mean, clearly infrastructure needs to be there. We had some really interesting discussions before that panel, actually, on, on really how to make that infrastructure more resilient. Um, we face a lot of um, regulatory problems, I think. I totally agree with a lot of things which Dominic said, very wise words, really. I hope people pick up on that. I'm also sitting on the uh, Ofcom advisory board, so we're crunching through a lot of these discussions uh, again and again uh, but clearly we need I think we need a, a totally innovative approach to how to handle digital in general I mean we have been innovating on the edges quite a lot we need to innovate more on the infrastructure and actually we need to innovate all more on the standards and the regulatory body who underpin all that and I think that's coming far too short in, in the world in general well, let me pick up on something that you, know, you mentioned, which was about lock-in and vendor lock-in, and throw that back to the man from Google. So, Julian, I mean, we do see that a lot. I mean, the, the interoperability isn't always there um, with new ideas. How do you overcome that? And does a company like, for example, Google, because you're sitting here, want to overcome that when it can keep all these lovely, rich customers? So, um there's one thing that lives really at Google and that proves us wrong, uh, wrong. that proves us, <laughs> that proves us right. <laughs> well, uh, that proves us right every day is that open wins. Um, so um, our entire technology stack 
is built on open technology and we consistently open everything. So uh, we sometimes pay the price for it, you know, uh, when you look at what Android is today and, and how difficult it is to manage it and keep it on the straight path. Um, but the success of Android, which, you know, uh, is the one we know, uh, would not have existed if it, not had, if it had not been open technology. Um, and Chrome is the same story and all of our technology developments are the same story. So we, we just uh, released new uh, machine learning um, uh, software and just we released that to the open world because we believe that general adoption will make it work. So uh, I think I can be fairly short in my answer is that, you know, we, we think that closing anything is a dead end. We, we just don't do this. Yeah. If I may just add on that, because I think you raise a very important point. I think Telco historically has always had to be open and f have full interoperability with everything. If you look at a lot of new systems that has been developed, it was just fully the contrary. WhatsApp, not, no interoperability. Viber, no interoperability. Skype, no interoperability. They have been able to build a huge platform with a locking of customers and community systems because they had no interoperability. And there again, that's where regulation for me is really an issue because why do you impose full interoperability to telco, which are very much able to do WhatsApp. I can tell you WhatsApp when it was bought, it was 50 people and I could have uh, invested 10 WhatsApp every year in the telco company. The only thing is I was never allowed to put that on the market because I had to make it interoperable with all the telco in the world. WhatsApp had not that, so they could start to build it and create it a big community platform and then get a lot of money for it. So there again you see that the perverse effect of regulation, which of course from the beginning has a lot of sense and it's because you had monopoly and you wanted to make sure that those monopoly would disappear and you would have competition. But today, a lot of this regulation is hampering innovation in Europe and uh, making sure that you can have a lot of players that starts from very little, 50 people, paid $17 million. So I can tell you these are things that really makes me nervous because I really think we spoil our chances in Europe by behaving the way we behave. But isn't that what we want in Europe? I mean, I go to an awful lot of startup conferences and hear everyone bemoaning the fact that we haven't got the next European Google or, or Twitter or whatever it is. And, you know, being able to grow that fast in that sort of community, surely if it was coming from Europe, we'd all say it was great. And we just say we don't like it because it's American. I think the conditions are not there in Europe to be able to create it. We have many different languages, we have many different regulations, we don't have one single uh, customer basis to, to run it out. So in that sense, what you see in Europe is a lot of creativity, a lot of startups, and they, they are not able to scale up. So what happens, and then to a certain level, they are then bought because they have very good technology by the big players that have a lot of money today. So it will be very, very difficult in the coming years to build a European player because the others have so much money that every time you have something that starts to pop up, it is bought for prices which are completely crazy, 30 times EBITDA, even when EBITDA, or 10 times turnover where they may no EBITDA. So, I mean, there is no single European player that is able to buy those prices. Yeah, you know, I, I so resonate with that, you know, because I, 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 I was co-founder of my own company called World Sensing. We're probably no more, one of the more successful Internet of Things companies. Well, we're in B2B, so business to business. And maybe that brings me to the point. I think Europe is really good in, in B2B, actually, very strong in a lot of B2B aspects. And, and, and I think we should leverage on that. So, uh, and I agree, one of the biggest problems we, 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 we particularly uh, struggle with is investment. So, I mean, you know, I always say is a factor 10, 1 to 10 to 100. If you go, let's say, from Spain, where we started in Barcelona, to London, it's 1 to 10 investment story. And then you go to Silicon Valley, it's another factor of 100, right? So um, you need cash to scale. You need cash to bridge uh, sales cycles, uh, particularly, you know, with my company, it took us six years to get the first paycheck in. I had to pay 50 people their salaries so they could go home and feed their families, right? So without investment, you can't do it. So a lot of these European uh, talented companies just don't make it because we don't have these big checks. As simple as that, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah or, or they move to the US and the, the sale drone, which I specifically brought forward, is a, a British citizen and a Belgian citizen. And I was always wondering, why did they go there? Yeah. I mean, is it because 
just VC or is it because they've got the people there and the infrastructure there and the, the environment and the culture to create these new ideas there? I personally don't think it's a market thing. So people argue that the U.S. market is much bigger, much more homogeneous. But actually, when you start selling into the U.S., you realize every state have their own regulation, not as badly as the uh, as Europe in a sense, and in terms of divergence. But it's it's not so homogeneous. I think it's a it's literally a VC thing. I came to this conclusion: we have the same talent, if not even more talented people. We have the same conditions. You look at Berlin. You look at Paris now. I'm not sure how Belgium is doing, but you know you have a lot. London, you have loads of really entrepreneurial cities, but we lack these Kleiner Perkins who could, without a whimper of an eye, could just invest half a billion dollars to scale up what became YouTube to scale up what, you know, became whatever platform you know. So we had YouTubes before, they're not the first ones, and uh, it happens to be the right investment which brought it up. And what, what you see is, is a paradoxical evolution. You see more and more companies from Silicon Valley hiring people in Europe because the cost of the people in Silicon Valley is so huge mm. that they can't afford it and they can find very, very good talent in Europe for half the price. So you see more and more people going there, getting there indeed the money, but making people employed in Europe to develop the system that work to enrich and to develop system that will be America based. So it's, it's very strong, very strong paradox for me. I, I recently moved back from, from, from the Valley, and started two weeks ago here back. And um, one thing that is less present in Silicon Valley is this concept of Europe or US versus the world. Mm -hmm. um, so this is very present here. But, you know, at Google, the CEO is a first generation immigrant, uh, you know, whose parents were, you know, digging rice somewhere in the northern, northern India. Same thing for Microsoft. Um, level minus one is, you know, mostly Asian, um, and, you know, there are actually a limited number of Americans working at, at Google and even in Silicon Valley now. So this concept of nation states is very important for Europe, um, much less so for the average Chinese and the average Indian, and uh, does not live a lot in, in, in the valley. Um, I guess it will change in the U.S. in the coming years. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why he's back. <laughs> but history is a pendulum, but uh, you're, you're right. <laughs> okay, let me turn a little bit to this idea of the internet of skills. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, isn't there a, a, a trust question there? Whereas if someone has, you know, perhaps worked harder to acquire a skill or you've, you've, you've got a more traditional understanding of how that skill came about, you trust it more. And yeah, how do you overcome definitely. That? Well, I, you know, I leave these questions to pro this audience, I have to say. Um, we're pushing technology in a sense. Th there's always a, a trust question. So the, 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 the ultimate question is, would you undergo an eye operation uh, with a doctor who is maybe on the other side of the planet, right? So that's, that's a question I pose people. Hands up, who would? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay, I'm going to take you as test objects later on. You're not off the hook for your bravery, okay? Um, I've got good facial mem memory, I'll find you in the crowd. So, um, but we can do other things. So, you know, the uh, CIO of uh, Rolls Royce is a good buddy of mine, and he, he said, Misha, we have a real problem because, you know, we have planes landing on an island because the, the engine has a problem. And uh, they, need, they need to wait a day until they can fly in uh, engineers to solve the problem. So if we had an internet of skills edge, they could do that. Ebola crisis, same thing. So King's College was leading the UK response of the Ebola crisis in Sierra Leone. And the doctors told us back, we need skills, simple skills, not for operations, stuff like palpation of the stomach, taking the temperature. And they didn't have enough medical skills to actually execute that stuff. So if we had things like these, not super critical, but something which is like mid-level uh, trust from a trust point of view, I think that would be a, a first step to really revolutionizing labor as we have known it until today. Perhaps building on that, I think what you see now more and more is that the power of internet in, in teaching 
if you look at Coursera, if you look at MOOCs and things like that, I think it's already much closer to us than, yeah. than, than what you are talking about. It's a real power, mainly for emerging countries, but also for us, to be able to access to people from the best universities in the world for almost nothing. I mean, just look at Coursera. It's a fantastic system where you have videos and courses online from the best university in the US giving for free in all the world, and you can even get certificates and things like that. So I think the, the power of internet is also that, is also spreading information, spreading teaching, spreading skills to a very, very uh, broad audience, and thereby being able to, to really uh, help people uh, sort out from, uh, from the crowd. So I think that's already living now. Well, let me stay with the issue of trust and turn perhaps from human learning to machine learning. Uh, and this idea that we must give our data away to help these new machines learn what it's like to become more human and therefore more useful to us. I mean, there is still, if you like, a gap between the US and the EU in, in how we perceive privacy and data protection. I mean, how do you get around that? I mean, how do you use this data that is what makes us human to try and teach a machine to be more human without people going, no, 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 I don't want that. Me, right? That's for you because Google's heavily involved in machine learning at the moment. <laughs> I think everybody's very involved in machine learning at the moment. Okay. You know, uh, uh, machine learning is definitely, I did not want to bring the name too obviously into my few slides because everybody talks about machine learning, but I think everybody thinks machine learning now and it's really, uh, we are, everybody's looking at that as a way to solve big problems. Of course, you know, before we get and adopt these kind of technologies, it takes time and um, you know, it's a good thing that these discussions are happening and that technology providers are spending enough time with the regulators and with the constituents to think through, you know, some of these things. So things, one thing is sure is that <laughs> things are not done um, in a hurry, you know, like people are spending the time to think through what the different conditions will be. And there's this big discussions about driverless cars, you know, who would have to have to make these ethical choices. And uh, I can, you know, be assured that a year or a year and a half before this question hit the press, it was debated openly within Google as one of the hot topics that we need to solve before this thing. So um, it's going to be a gradual process. What is really uh, a conviction for uh, all technology enthusiasts, uh, would they be employed by one or the other uh, company, is that um, machines are much better at doing some things than humans. And there is no reason to keep humans do these nasty things that, you know, bring them into depression, ruin their lives, you know, and make them unhappy for all their lives. So if you can delegate part of that job to machines that actually do it better and free up time for humans to do what they are, to do more what they are good at, you know, create, relate with emotions, um, this is, this is not a dream, you know, this is again, the future is now. Um, this is literally what uh, these teams are thinking about. You know, delegate what burdens the human and allow the human to do more creation. And creation, the machines do quite well. They turn out, it turns out that you know, in the last game of Go where DeepMind beat the Go, the, 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 it was creative, it created things. Um, but what it never did was relate with an emotion. And this I, is, I, this I, is important. It never apologized for losing. You know, somebody asked, my daughter asked me, so how, how will we know when actually the machine will be uh, almost like a human? Said, when it apologizes for losing and it means it, which it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, do you want to answer the question about the, these ethics? I mean, how much should we be looking at the ethical questions around technologies before rushing to try and invent them? I, I always look at innovation in a very positive way. I think you, you cannot stop innovation, you need to use it. Probably the only place where I am not at ease, it's everything which is linked to artificial intelligence, which goes way beyond what we can think. And I think where I'm very much in favor of deregulation, I think there is probably one area where I think regulation is not only present, it's like we have, been a, we have had to regulate uh, genetics 
manipulation and things like that. Because if you let uh, the medical world do whatever they can, you would end up with, with potentially a lot of problems. I think the same will need to happen for artificial intelligence. I think you should keep it because I think it can indeed help a lot of elements, but you need to put a framework and boundaries before it goes too fast, too far, like we have done with, the, with genetics. And, and that's for me where I personally think that there is a limit to what you can allow uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning go. But isn't there an extent where almost all of these technologies that we're talking about have some element of artificial intelligence? I mean, even a simple app like you're showing the Springboard app, I mean, there were, were, you know, these suggestions has some form of intelligence. I mean, Google from the start is a machine learning yeah. organization. Mm -hmm. So do we... We, we talk about machine learning now as this new next generation thing, but spam, you know, has been handled a long time with machine learning. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just happening. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to push you a little bit further on, on being more definitive about where that line is. But I think as long as the new technology really helps you as a person to live better, to work smarter or whatever, I think it's acceptable. If you have, like, for instance, a Google that's helping you to plan the day, to, to warn you when there is some traffic jam, to warn you when there is a conflict in your agenda, to replace a bit your becoming your personal assistant. If you have smart homes technology where you are able to put the heat on before you come home or put your, um, your oven on or thing like that. I think this is all very much acceptable, even to go as far as, as having remote operations. I think this is really providing the help of big specialists to areas where normally you would not be able to have them. So I think somewhere, somehow, it's everything which is linked to living better, working smarter for me is acceptable. When it's go further than it, it and, and, it's, and it's not definite. I think there is still a lot of work to be done on how you define the line, as there has been a lot of discussion for genetics as well. So I think there will still be, probably in five years' time, we'll still be debating there, and the line will move, probably. I think what is today acceptable is probably less than will be acceptable tomorrow, because minds will, will evolve. And we'll still be talking about Asimov's law of robotics. Uh, Misha, do you want to tackle that ethics question? Yeah, actually, it's a, I think it's a good question. So whilst I'm not taking much responsibility on trust because that's something which consumers need to build over the years, I think in terms of the ethics, we as uh, researchers and scientists actually need to really stand up because we understand what that technology can do. I also feel we should be consulted more frequently what that type of stuff can do as, for instance, the Internet of Skills. What would that mean if it's in 2030 up and running? Um, generally, though, you know, I understand that people freak out today with all these wonderful technologies coming out of companies like Google. Google, but it also takes 10 years for you guys to get used to new stuff, okay? Um, a study at King's has found that out. It takes about 10 years for people just to adapt new stuff, the same as we kind of took 10 years to adapt to the car when we had horses before, uh, to electricity when we had candles before, uh, to AI when we didn't have AI before. So, you know, our kids will be natively embracing all that, and, and time will just go on. But uh, so from that point of view, I think, you know, time will take care of itself, but from an ethics point of view, we need to talk more. I agree with that. And so if you were to come up with an idea of, of how that sort of questioning and interaction and asking of academics would look in the future, what would your ideal be? How to construct the... Uh, the sort the, of consultation or the, the, the feedback of, of ideas. Um, Good question. Um, specifically for Europe, you mean? Yeah. Well, there's, I think currently, as part of the Horizon 2020 framework, the, the innovation research framework, there's a lot of consultation going on, actually. So I think that's a very good move. I was also involved in shaping some part of that more on the ICT side. So there's a lot of discussion going on. Maybe we could kind of increase the frequency of that because technology moves quicker and quicker. Um, and, you know, AI will accelerate uh, things even more. Even though, personally, I think it will never... Unless we, uh, as long as we have control of our own fate, it will not push us over the edge. You know, we got, I have a good, a good story from a pilot of a friend of mine, BA pilot. He says, Misha, the only reason I'm still going into this cockpit uh, for work is because if I didn't do this, people wouldn't fly. Okay? Machines could have flown machines, uh, uh, airplanes for the last 20 years and would have done a much better job than pilots have, but because of uh, technology trust issues, humans will always be in the loop. Um, so therefore, you know, Let's, let's see what time will tell, but the humans will always, always be there, I hope. Let's see. 
Well, yeah, I'm going to read out a rather nice tweet that was, in a world where Google can bring you back 100,000 answers, a librarian is the only one who can bring you back the right answer, <laughs> which is a quote from Neil Gaiman, who I'm a big fan of. Awesome. Very good. Um, so you wanted to talk a little bit, I think, um, you mentioned legislation earlier. I mean, can we legislate ethics in this area? Or has this got to be, you know, Asimov's guidelines for robotics don't have quite the same ring to it, but, um, you know, do we always need laws in, in terms of technology that we don't yet have or understand? I think it's a difficult question. I think what, where I am for, I mean, I think legislation should come in when you have abuses, to sanction abuses. I think today in Europe we have way too many legislation beforehand and that really uh, diminish innovation and, and freedom of action. And I think also legislation is extremely slow, and particularly Europe, sorry for the people in the room, but we are extremely slow at changing legislation because the whole governance process is really a nightmare. And so in that sense, when legislation comes, it's already outdated. So I think the only way to be able to keep up and to move is to deregulate and be much faster to regulate when there are abuses. So in the question of ethics, I think it's very difficult to regulate before ends, but when you see things happening where you really think it is not acceptable, then I think you should intervene. Yeah, we, there is the same impression from within, uh, from within Google, and um, I can only relate to my interactions with other Googlers, and, and, but um, um, the, the issues always come when there is this long gap and gray zone between what the technology can do and what the law actually uh, provides. And, and when there's this uncertainty, then everybody goes in all directions and there's all this confusion and, and users lose, lose, lose trust and, and, then, and then there's big risk in how the, the technology can be used. The moment the law comes, it's always fascinating at, at Google, the moment there is a law, all the discussion ends, we do not operate beyond the law, and we just execute upon the law. The problem is always when the law is not yet there, and then everybody has his own interpretation, and there are rumors, and, and we need data allocation, and no, you don't need data allocation, who says that, yeah, my friend, or you know? And um, so, so this is, I think, the, the part of the friction comes from the speed at which technology involves and the speed at which te law, the law follows, and I think probably it's the right order, but maybe the gap could be shorter. And the speed in which humans adjust to all of it as well. Well, depending on the age of the humans, because my kids uh, adapt very fast. <laughs> I, think, I think we need artificial intelligence to do law. <laughs> Take it easy, guys, okay? We'll leave it to him. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't think we... I think it's there. I should fish out the article, but yeah. Shh. <laughs> Okay, well, we've all seen Terminator, so we know what happens when Skynet becomes self-aware. And on that rather terrible note, I want you to thank this panel very much for their input. Oh, thank you. <laughs>